Let's open up this pit. My name is Adam Zuniga. I am the host of Not Fest Beer Pit Tasting Live. And this is a very special edition because it is the first Not Fest Beer Pit Tasting Live. And we are here with Dan Bronson, affectionately known as Big Dan Bronson by his coworkers, the general manager of Single Cut Beer Smiths in Astoria, Queens, which is New York City. Dan, thank you so much for joining us. Hails. Hails. What's up, Adam? How are you, man? I am well. I'm even better now. Um, a little bit of backstory. I wanted to kick off the live stream here and the live tastings with Not Fest with a brewery that I know and love and am comfortable and familiar with from my near from my years in New York City, man. And when I first moved back to New York from LA, Single Cut is one of the first breweries I visited because friends knew that I was into this whole connection of hard rock and heavy metal and craft beer. And Single Cut was one of the first like new wave of New York breweries that was flying the flag for it. So it's an honor to have you here, man. And I also thought we should kick off these tastings with a triple IPA because triple IPA definitely leads to good conversation. So what do you think? Yeah, man. Good conversations or mumbles. I like it. Either way, we're winning here, man. All right. All right. Um, I want to talk uh, about you first and foremost, and then let's lead into the brewery. So uh, you were the first that Single Cut volunteered, man, for being an enthusiastic spokesman for the brand, for the beer. On these chats, we talked to both head brewers and head bangers from any given brewery. So I want to know how you got into craft beer, yeah. how you connected with Single Cut, mm -hmm. and then tell us more about how your day-to-day -day looks and then please speak to the beer, the brand, and all that good stuff. So first and foremost, how did you get into craft beer? Oh, man. Well, I'm a San Diego kid originally. So right. growing up in like, you know, the, one of the hoppiest places on earth, it was really unavoidable. So back in the day, I worked in the film industry, but I always worked in hospitality. And even I, basically when I was 16, I kind of got given the beer kid job at the resort I worked at. And ever since then, man, it's been professional love at first sight. And, you know, career changes come and go. Film didn't really do it for me as I was growing up. It, it wasn't where my passion was. For me, I always loved live music and being in bars. So finding my way into bars full time was where I, I saw myself going and where I ended up. I moved to New York City when I was a kid. Worked all over the place, music venues, bars, breweries, all that cool stuff. And then uh, when Single Cut was starting up, uh, the OG crew that was building out used to come to a bar that I'd work at, and we'd just get nerdy about music all the time. Um, we had this bar that would only play vinyl, or not only, but always from our you know our own selections. And this is back in the mid-2000s, so before it was maybe quite as uh, commonplace as it is now, and thank God it is now. I love those warm tones yeah. for sure. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Sure. Keep on rocking it for sure. And then we just got to, uh, to you know, just kept talking and going. And then we clearly saw that, you know, our loves of music and, and beer were equitable and really what drove us. Um, that's something I still share to this day. It's really the the driving force for Single Cut 2. Uh, you know, we're big believers in synesthesia. You know, you can you can listen to beer, you can taste music. And that really inspires a lot of our brewing, uh, whether that's listening to heavy music, whether that's listening to something uh, that's a little bit more dad rock oriented, depends on the day, but it definitely... Sure really makes um, what we do uh, happen. It's really our inspiration. Um, and then, yeah, I've been blessed for the last six years to be the general manager at Single Cut. So, I mean, I won't get into all of it. I mean, like a lot of people, I'm just kind of a firefighter, just depending on what size of the fire it is. That's kind of what I get to do on a day in, day out basis. Yeah. And then I'm very spoiled that I get to oversee um, personally uh, all of our tap rooms, which is great because that's where we really get to share our passion of music and beer with all of our friends um, and all, all of our tap rooms are big vinyl havens too. It's kind of one of the reasons why a brewery got opened anyways. We needed a place to put all of our amps and all of our records. So nice. not open a brewery to do that. It seemed like the coolest way to do it we could think of. Most metal. So I'm glad you and I have a similar kind of origin story being turned on to hops in Southern California and that leading us to New York and continuing to guide the way. Um, can you tell us how many tap rooms Single Cut has as of now? Yeah, absolutely. So we've got our, our main flagship, the mothership down in beautiful Astoria, Queens. That's where I hail from. And then we actually have another facility up in the capital region of New York in an area called Clifton Park. It's like right in between Albany and Saratoga Springs for you East Coasters. So you can come up and watch the ponies race. I mean, I don't, but I hear it's great. 
Um, so either if you're up south or uh, down north, or however you want to say it, we, we got a place for you to come in, spin some records. We're always BYOV, um, though we are pretty selective. Bring something that's garbage. You'll maybe get a couple tracks in and we'll pull it. But usually it works out well for everybody involved. Sure. Excellent. And uh, tell us more just about the name, Single Cut. Yeah. When was the brewery founded? Uh, who founded it? What is the story behind the brewery? Let's hear it. Yeah, so we're going back to 2012 for when we actually opened. We started building the place out in late 2009, early 2010. Big boss man here is Rich Bassetta, who I wish could be here today. Major shredder of the highest order, which mm -hmm. is where we actually get our name. Single cut is a guitar body style. So if you can imagine a classic Les Paul, you know, instead of being the snowman shape, there's a little divot on the bottom. So yep. you can hit those higher frets faster, cleaner, really, really consistently. That body style is a single cut. And so we took that to be our inspiration. And it, it's a little bit of a double entendre, too. Um, if anybody else grew up, you know, with a with a dad who was a perfectionist, you got to measure twice and cut once. It's that single cut. It, it really made it into what we do. Um, we take life and we take music for fun. But when it comes to, you know, what we do in our day in, day out, uh, we're kind of perfectionists. Uh, we're that way with music too, to be honest. Um, so, you know, we kind of adopted it as our raison d'etre and kind of our, um, our, our motto for the company of mastery knows no shortcut. And that kind of ties in with our single cut, uh, ethos too. Um, yeah, man. And, and 10 years later now, um, still rocking and rolling. Um, it's been wild, dude. Yeah. I mean, like you were talking Adam. I mean, New York city 10 years ago was very, very different for beer. It was a little, there was great beer for sure, but most of it came from outside of the city, um, which is cool and all, but we're, we're the greatest city in the world. No offense to anybody else or offense. Depends on you can take it out. You want it's New York city, not a hot take there, but having to get our, uh, our beer from Pennsylvania half the time was no bueno. We, that didn't work for us. So when we opened up, we had two big ethos uh, for our brewing and three big goals. The first one we hit right away, have a home for all of our amps and all of our vinyls that we couldn't keep in our apartments anymore. Good. Two, we wanted to make traditional lager, which at the time wasn't being done anywhere in the area. So we brought in traditional horizontal lagering tanks. Lagers like to ferment on the bottom of the tank. So give them more space so the yeast can be happy and healthy and spread out. Excellent. And the third for us was uh, making super fresh IPA in the five boroughs. We're one of the hoppiest cities in the world right now. But 10 years ago, it was it was a little different in on the scene. Some beautiful IPAs. But, you know, not a ton of options. So we were really excited to throw in our, our hat into the ring there and start churning out some loud beers. I love it. So when I first uh, visited Single Cut in Astoria, I knew something was happening here, man, because all the, the tap handles were headstocks, basically. <laughs> I love the Single Cut theme. I noticed like a lot of the beers were named for musicians ranging from hard rock to heavy metal. So I immediately felt at home. And I'm glad you've continued to fly the flag for essentially 10 years now that is most metal man and like you said mastery knows no shortcut we have a similar mantra here we are starting small with these beer pit tastings and we are going live to bring in subscribers so they can ask additional questions the tough questions for all you brewers and breweries out there and we think it's going to just continue to build and build and grow from here man just like your brewery so i'm glad to kick it off with you and uh, I want to talk a little bit about the beer before we start bringing some subscribers in to ask you individual questions. Um, what is the story behind 200 Watt? Yeah, man. So this is our loudest beer. So we had to name it after our loudest amps. Um, our flagship beer is 18 Watt. It's a 5% IPA. So we wanted to name it after an amp that was all about tone and not so much about raw output of uh, uncut, unfettered volume. Awesome. But this one, this is all about chuck and restraint. So, you know, we looked at our tone master and uh, we looked at our, our orange thunder verb and said, what, what should this beer be? This has got to be the 200 watt, man. So this was put it all in, go crazy, go big. It's a Saturday night beer for some Saturday night music is kind of how we feel about it. Ah. Aesthetically, it's inspired by our 18 watts. So it's got a lot of the same vibe. Um, this beer is going to be really, really big, really extreme. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we wanted to make sure we had it in was our kind of super secret hop oil stash, um, which I'll talk about more in a little bit. We'll that get to that. Thank you. In here, which is, which is a big one. 
mm-hmm. and then tons of citrus, tons of ripe tropical fruit, a lot of stone fruit, nectarines. Um, brewed this beer with our house proprietary ale yeast. So that's mm-hmm. a yeast which we've been growing, cultivating, and then propagating. So making more of it from small samples for 12 years now, um, which is our own unique yeast. It's, it's banked for us. It's kind of genetically identifiable as its own thing. Um, and it just makes unparalleled product that tastes uniquely single cut, regardless of what your personal taste is. That's metal. Does anything else come between 18 watt and 200 watt? Or is, was the idea is you wanted like a, you know, you wanted a practice amp and then the fucking stack, like the full stack. So that, is that, that basically, it, yeah. that was the lead from one to the other? At 5%, half stack at 6.6. Uh huh. Full stack at 8.6, 200 watt right here at the big bad 10. And then in addition to my dead metal days, I'm a, I'm a big deadhead. So, uh, I want to, at one point I got to get the 26,000 watt, the wall of sound. Oh. <laughs> you know what? I got my own feelings about deadheads and the grateful dead, but one cannot argue with the wall of sound, <laughs> at least the presentation alone, man. So that is metal in its own right. Um, I'm going to say one more thing, and I'm sure it kind of registered with me in the past, but the whole idea of like drink loud, when I started working with KnotFest to develop the beer pit on their website, it says they're all about loud music, loud mm-hmm. art, loud culture. So we kind of coined this idea of like drink loud and drink proud. And now that I put it all together, of course, the roots of that are in my initial visits to Single Cut, man. So thank you for that. And after the the intro to the beer there, I think um, it's one thing to talk about it, but it's another thing to drink it. So I'm going to take just a moment here. Uh, I want to bring in some of the some of the subscribers to the live stream. Uh, I see Eric. I see Rick. I see Jeff. And let's give them a moment to come on board with us. And we're all going to pour the beer together. We're going to drink it and we're going to talk about it. And for those at home, oh, there we go. (laughs) All right, we have Eric, we have Jeff. I can see you, I can hear you. Thank you so much for joining us in the pit and supporting craft beer and heavy metal and being a subscriber to the Not Fest Beer Pit. We're grateful for it. Absolutely. Great to be here. Hell yeah. Uh, you want to just tell us a little bit about yourselves, what brought you to beer and metal, how you found the pit? Tell us what brought uh, you here. Um, I actually found it on Twitter through uh, Edward Theory because uh, they don't, they, even though they're in Virginia, they don't ship to North Carolina. So that was my way around it. And my, um, I couldn't let my cousin get one up on me because he got it in Massachusetts somehow. And I'm one state away and couldn't get it. So, um, so they had promoted it saying that they were in the first, uh, you know, the first batch. Um, so I found it and got it. And um, I'm also uh, president of our uh, homebrew club in, in the Raleigh area. Oh, so, excellent. Uh, yeah. Yep. So that kind of led me, you know, to a little bit of everything in, in a roundabout way, found my way there. So um, yeah. I've enjoyed, well, I've gotten every box so far. So um, loved them, loved all the little gifts and stickers and the beers are awesome. So it's been great. That's great. Thank you. You cut out there for a moment, but I heard that we have a home brewer in the house and it sounds like Adroit Theory first turned you onto the beer pit. So shout out to Adroit Theory in Virginia. What about you, Jeff? Tell us about your passion for beer and metal and what led you to the Knotfest Beer Pit. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, really, the uh, the Phantom Bride beer was, was what uh, I was like so pumped to see that in, in the box. I had been like okay. looking for that. Um, I'd always heard Belching Beaver was good, never had it, loved Deftone. So I was like, oh, like that's awesome. They'll, they'll send Hell it yeah. to me, you know? Uh, <laughs> so yeah, and yeah, same thing. Like Eric said, I, I've, uh, I've gotten all the boxes so far. It's, it's, you know, it's cool getting all the, uh, all the stuff. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm actually like in the same neighborhood as single cut, Dan. I'm like, I'm like down the street from you guys, basically. I'm on 20th oh. street. 
Um, Look at that. Actually re- representing. Uh, Love it. My shirt, yeah. And I drank nice. my 200 watt already, so I, I've got some fuzz box that I'm going to drink and uh, and listen listen along. That works. That works. So, Jeff, thank you so much. Sounds like so we have a single cut neighbor on board as well. Again, our gratitude for joining us in the pit. And what we we used to send these uh, these interviews out pre-recorded, but we thought take it live, capture the moment, and bring subscribers in to ask questions. So by all means, drink the beer with us or drink uh, the fuzz box that you have there, Jeff. When you all have a question for myself or for Single Cut Dan here, chime in. Um, for right now, what we're going to do is pour the beer together. And Dan, I'm going to ask you if you can walk us through the aroma, the appearance, the flavor, and the finish grateful for it so here we have cheers yeah 200 watt coming in hot here Mm. oh there we go if you all could hear that that is our producer chris and the voice of god the man behind the (laughs) virtual curtain and he's drinking with us so so 200 watt is like a passion project for the beer smiths for sure because this is only the second time we've brewed this beer. Last time we brewed it was in 2015. So oh, wow. just like a lifetime ago in the beer world, you know? So this was a throwback to a time when IPA looked a lot different. Uh, yeah. Now it's been many, many a year since we filtered our IPAs. Um, but for us with, with 200 watt, we wanted it to be a little bit of a throwback. So the malt bill on this is a little bit more complex than what we traditionally do for some of our bigger IPAs. Um, we, uh, find it a little bit. So basically we wanted it to drop out and be a little clearer, a little crisper. We wanted to go like a little old school here on this one. So this beer is really for us about resin and like a love letter, not just to IPAs of a little while ago, but kind of like a love letter back to our beer 10 years ago. I love it. Yeah. And we wanted it to like, like always, I mean, it can be loud. It can be intense. We can update the flavors a bit, but, but keep a little OG tradition. So, you know, just looking at this, this guy, there's this beautiful kind of light copper color, which comes from a few different places, our malt bill, but also a slightly adjusted boil on this beer. So we can get a little bit more time and exposure to the buds in there. Uh, and if Jeff, I'm sure has seen it before, but our OG brewery in Queens is like really DIY. It's a very big brewery for a very small building. We got 5,000 square feet and we have a, a 30 barrel brew house in there. We, we churned out 20,000 kegs in its last year of just being that one brewery alone. Um, and we've really been able to make that, that, that rig really special and do some really cool, very distinct things with it. So it was fun to get to play with all the old toys. The aroma for this one and this whole beer for me is all about citrus resin. I'm not going to cut you off, Dan. I've just got to say the moment you pop the can and pour it into a glass, the aroma just leaps out. So tell us more. Yeah, it's big. Uh, like I said, a little like old school on this one. So for us, like the inspiration, it's it's citrus resin. And also like, you know, we're big cannabis enthusiasts too. So when we lean into something that's resinous, we want it to be deeply resinous. Yeah. Um, we don't have any in this particular beer, but like we love brewing and playing with terpenes. And so bringing out those really, really deep, intense, a little bit um, below the surface, uh, fruit, tropical and resinous notes that we can coax out of the, the hops or something that we're really, really big into. I do want to take a that. Dan, when you when you say resin, can you tell everyone who's on the chat as well as watching from home what you mean? Because that's a word that is definitely common throughout the craft beer industry. Right. So what do you mean when you say resin and resinous? When you're a sophomore in college and uh, you spent your last five dollars <laughs> on splitting a pizza, <laughs> there's gonna be nothing else to do this week, and you scrape the bowl and you're like, I can make this work. Resin. You got me. You got me. Most that is a good a and better explanation than I could have hoped for. <laughs> like a hyper concentration of oils that either through oxidation or through heat, um, the flavors uh, meld a little bit less, uh, or I'm sorry, meld a little bit more. They get a little bit deeper, a little darker. Uh, depending on how your palate is, uh, that resin can really be taken um, as like kind of a must, but it can also be done as like a, like a musky like fruit. Um, it's just very deep. It's not good, bad. It depends on how you play with it and how you use it. Mm -hmm. Old school West coast IPA. Like it sounds like Adam and I really came up on 
that was a big prominent feature in kind of old school American hop growing. You get a lot of grapefruit flavor out of classic American hops. You get a lot of that deep resin, that citrus resin. So for us, this beer is a big throwback to that style of brewing. And then, you know, when you start sipping it and you actually get into the taste, I'm going to indulge myself in a second. Here. <laughs> Let's go. Cheers, all. <laughs> Cheers, all. <laughs> this is personal experience. <laughs> yeah, I really love this one. Uh, this was, like I said, we kind of brewed this just for ourselves. Um, we try and sneak one of those in every quarter. It's like maybe this isn't like the um, the what the what all the the beer nerdiest beer nerds are clamoring for right now. Though actually, I disagree. I think true beer nerds always love drinking old school throwback beers. Agreed. Yeah, much agreed. We wanted yeah. to make sure that it has a, you know, a really rich malt base. So for me, a lot of this flavor, though it's dominated by the hops and the way that the yeast plays with those hops, for me, I get like beautiful, lush toffee bread. And then that really makes all the citrus pop. Um, so you get kind of that candied grapefruit, that candied orange. Um, one of the ways that our house yeast plays with a lot of like new age hops is it brings out a lot of tangerine, which is my personal favorite fruit. So this one's got a lot of that tangerine skin, which I absolutely dig. A little bit of sweetness in the finish, which I would expect and want in something over 10%. And I think it's really clean, too, for 10. That's kind of the signature of our house yeast. We can get really, really big. There's a little warmth to it, but I want a little bit of warmth in a triple IPA. Alcoholic warmth? Yeah, just a touch. Yeah, yeah. I've just got to, I've got to back up everything you said, because in this case, like the aroma definitely matches the flavor. You can see immediately, like um, it has a little bit of like a brazen gold color. We know there's more malt in the beer because more malt in the beer leads to more alcohol. There's no excessive legs, legs. It doesn't stick to the glass that heavily. So it is deceptively alcoholic, deceptively boozy. It's very smooth and easy to drink. Uh, up front, I mean, all those sticky resinous concentration of like essential oils in the hops that you were just talking about. The big citrus flavor is all there and it really clings from start to finish, which I personally love and enjoy. Like you said, I think all old school beer nerds, beer geeks, whatever you want to call it, no one's going to turn up their nose or turn down uh, a classic single, double, or triple IPA for that matter, man. And uh, most importantly, like you said, it finishes clean. Clearly your yeast are diligent during cleanup and the final stage of the fermentation process. And uh, it's there's it's flawless. It's absolutely flawless. A lot of candied citrus. I even get like some tangerine as a perfect description. Uh, pineapple, there's some element going on, man. Yeah. It does have a little bit of a tropical hop note as well. So I don't know if it's just all the classic kind of American big C hops that lead to that citrus character. Here is beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. Or as we like to say here, it is metal. It is most metal, man. And I fucking dig it. Um, Eric and Jeff, do you want to kind of weigh in here? Just tell us what you smell and what you taste. Yeah, I just, I love the malt right in the, you know, it's the first thing you get right away. And, you know, then like you said, it kind of goes right into the, you know, the resin and the hops and then, you know, kind of hits you with all the different tropical flavors. And um, it, you, if I didn't look at the can and know that it was 10%, I would have never known. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's very sneaky, which is great. I mean, that's it. And like you said, it's a throwback. Um, I did have a question uh, for you. Uh, when you're designing the recipe, uh, you know, scaling up the recipe, I know how that can be, um, especially at a commercial level. Um, did you run into any, any hurdles or um, were you surprised by anything when you were scaling up this recipe? Yeah. Yo, Eric, that's a really great question. Um, you know, when we do collabs and stuff like that and we brew on the bigger systems, that's always a conversation we have with other brewers is like, you know, we can say brewing is science and it is on paper, but there's so much art to it, man. The math never scales the right way. To answer your question directly, we don't worry about that too much because after 10 years, we've had that same very customized system. So it is a 40 barrel system, but it, that's our, that's our pilot system. Now, you know, we know that thing like the back of our hands. So we brew recipes for that. And then at our other brewery, we have a much bigger system, but the actual 
uh, kettle is only a little bit bigger. It's it's about 55 barrels, um, though it's a much more tech and, uh, you know, fancy pants system, you know, that lets us churn out beer really, really fast. Our heart will always be in the OG, you know, uh, you know, pulling all the grain out by hand as opposed yeah. to having, you know, a bunch of pulleys and all that cool stuff. So, yeah, That's man, baby, it's really you know. it is, but <laughs> going back from the homebrew days, it's it doesn't it doesn't work, man. You know what I mean? You, you take your over recipes and you multiply it by 10, you're going to get a totally different beer and yep. maybe it'll be good, but who knows, man, you know. That's why I was curious. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Thank you. Excellent. Um, before we get into hop oils, because I want to know, I think there's some further mystery and a little bit of secret behind the proprietary use of hop oils in this beer. But Jeff, even though you're drinking another brew from Single Cut right now, you know, I mean, the power of suggestion is one thing. You know, people <laughs> say something and then you smell it and you taste it instantly. But does everything we're talking about uh, remind you of the beer that you drank when you first got the the beer pit box? Yeah, for sure. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I you know, it went down like super easy for ten percent. <laughs> I, I right. definitely remember that. <laughs> um, yeah. And like you know, just like looking at the color of the beer, you know, on on your guys' screens, like the the fuzz box is 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 a bit hazier. Right. We love our haze. Right. Always fun, but like. I love seeing that, like with you know, I love seeing like that more brownish kind of color. Like it's, uh, you know, it feels more like you're you're drinking like a beer. You know, it, it's not so much of the, uh, you know, the fruity stuff that that we sometimes get like hit in the face with all the time. Um, and yeah, just you know, always love like the that you know that dankness with like pretty much all like all single cut IPAs. You always get that dankness, so mm. it's it's the good stuff. I agree with you that it is definitely handsome in the glass. You know, I love it that you can say it. it is cloudy. You know, it is unfiltered to some degree, but it's not turbid. It's not thick. It's not hazy. Yeah. Um, it does remind me of how, like, initially double and triple IPAs were great for consumers and fans and people that thought they might not like uh, standard IPA. But because there is a bigger alcohol content, because there is, like, a bigger hop nose and flavor, the beer is not excessively bitter. You know, so it can easily, it's like hop candy and it can easily turn on people to think they don't like bitter beer to begin with because it is such a mouthful of both aroma and flavor. So Dan, uh, I want to know how you achieve that through the proprietary use of hop oils because hops come in a few different forms. I mean, the classically it was like full pellets or excuse me, full flowers, mm -hmm. which were kind of compressed down to pellets, which are typically like the most efficient form of brewing, I think. But uh, you can also almost like distill them further yeah. down into like oils or essential oils and tell us what that means and what you can reveal for how they're used at Single Cut. Yeah, it goes super deep. Well, I'll keep one secret and that's the partners that we work with. Um, but I'll tell you the rest. Um, yeah, the way that hops actually get into the beer, there's so many different ways. I mean, like, yeah, totally the the flour and the pellet. You can essentially buy hop keef these days too, which is super cool. Um, you know, and these 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 cryo hops and all this cool stuff. There's a lot of efficient ways of getting alpha acids, beta acids, and all the oils in the world into your beer real quick. Um, but for us we discovered this really cool technique, which is actually kind of a throwback because hop oils are actually a very classic uh, ingredient too, especially with like Czech brewing and like old school lager making, um, finding Sots oil, that was almost, you know, a commercial good a, a while ago. But as far as bringing that technology and that, uh, that workflow into the modern era of hops, which have these really robust, beautiful, and very volatile oils in them, was a pretty cool thing because what happens with us is that we fly out every year and we go and hand select all of our hops so that we can make sure we get the absolute best buds. You know, I think the biggest takeaway for brewing is that, you know, your yeast is always the most important thing you have and the way you treat it. That'll always be the most impactful on your beer. But after that, you know, you might have a commercial brand of hops, say Citra, but the Citra you get from farm A is different than the Citra you get from farm C. And then going even deeper in that, on Farm C, the citra that grew on X side of the hill or Y side of the hill or A side of the hill or it grew on a, in a valley that got 2% more rain, these are also, these are all, you know, majorly impactful. It's, it's the notion of terroir. It's really no different than winemaking. 
So when you find a super special batch of hops, you get that citra that's just ethereal. Like it speaks another language that you've never heard before. The whisper of angels into the ear of God. What are you going to do, man? You got to buy as much as you fucking can, but there is a shelf life. It only lasts so long. The gifts of nature last only as long as nature wants them to. So we got to bring science into it. So what we end up doing is we partnered with this distilling company. They don't distill liquor. They distill a million other things. And we were able to take our hand-selected batches, send them down to them. They can distill out the oils and save them in a solution and then ship us back literally a briefcase that looks like it's got Marcellus Wallace's soul in it. You know what I mean? Um, and we crack this thing open and it's just filled with test tubes, you know, irradiating neon green goodness. Um, and this hyper concentrated hop oil is just basically the distillate of really all of those intense, intricate flavors that we pulled out of those hops when we were rolling them in our hands out in the Pacific Northwest and really appreciating what made them special. They interact with the beer in a really, really cool way. So they're very volatile. So we've never exposed them to heat. So they go straight into the tank during our dry hopping process, even sometimes quite late in our dry hopping process after the beer is fully fermented and it's just pulling all that goodness out of the hops. What we get out of it is a really interesting character that's very, very intense. So we use them when we're going to do mega beers like 18 watt, which has a huge malt base um, and a lot of residual sugar and a lot of flavors going on because they can be a little intense, even used in extremely small quantities. But the thing that we really love about them is that they don't break down at the same rate as normal hops in a beer do. So when we send beer overseas um, to China, Japan, Sweden, this gives us an opportunity to sometimes send these beers who have our hop oils in it so that when our friends overseas get the beers and they're natively, you know, four weeks to five weeks old, they're going to crack those beers and they're going to taste like they're a week out of the tank and they're drinking them in the tap room with me and Jeff here in beautiful Astoria, Queens. That's amazing. That's amazing. So you're saying you have a, a mysterious partner who will remain nameless. Take essentially your favorite hop crops from any given year, distill them down to their essence, down to these hop oils that they then ship to you. And you can, what is the lifespan on that briefcase that arrives? I mean, can you keep it cold? And as far as you know, it will last uh, indefinitely until you brew with it? Or yeah. is it, it is. That's incredible. It's a, That's it's incredible. A time machine. Yeah, because I mean, I'm guessing a lot of people on this stream and out there in Twitch land or wherever else have had really bad experiences with like old IPA, where it is the hop oils that are kind of like cooling in the top of the can and the top of the bottle that oxidize the quickest. And when you take it, when you taste it, it's like wax and honey and cardboard. It's completely undesirable. So the fact that you can have these oils in the beer distilled from a mystery source that leads to a longer shelf life is incredible. So we were fortunate enough to get single cut 200 watt. I mean, it was literally canned uh, the week before it shipped out in the beer pit. And I have to give a shout to your sales team, to Ash and to Willie. I mean, they literally took the beer straight from canning uh, to our kind of retail partner called Roselle Park Wines and Spirits in New Jersey, there it could be boxed up and shipped out to consumers. And as we continue doing this, we want the process to become more and more efficient so that, of course, IPAs being the most volatile, we have them in a short period of time from packaging to delivery. And we did it with this beer, and you can clearly taste it in this beer. Like what I'm drinking right now is what was shipped to me from the Knotfest beer pit. Um, what would you say in terms of shelf life? Uh, do you feel like this will be the same beer in 30 days, in 60 days, in 90 days if it is kept cold? What would you say? Yeah. I mean, the honest answer is it'll be a different beer tomorrow and the day after that. And it was a different beer yesterday. Um, but as far as like really getting a brewer's intent quality on this product, I mean, it's two weeks old right now. Um, I think this will be, beer will be even better in probably two weeks. It'll soften a little bit more and those hop oils will start to become more expressive. So I'll, I'll keep it secret what's actually in the oil edition in this beer, but I expect to get a lot more pineapple in about like mm. two weeks. 
as it starts to mellow off. I think that the alcohol on this beer is already really pleasant and just a tiny bit of warmth, but that'll drop out even more. Um, and for a big old triple I like triple IPA like this, well, it's working as you can clearly. Ah. Um, <laughs> it has enough malt robustness that once we get down the line, like I'm going to throw a can of this in the back of my fridge and come back to it in six months. It's going to be a completely different product, but I'll bet it's going to be delicious. It really gets to taste a lot more of that toffee, that bread, that like very gentle kind of cookie flavor almost that's in the back of that malt bill. And we'll probably see those hops calm down a bit. Those hop oils will still be churning at a little bit of a lower threshold than what they're at right now. But we'll still probably get some of that candied pineapple. I'll bet it'll be tasting great. And cool. If you, if you remember back in the day, throw it back 10 years ago. Um, you know, there was a brewer in Colorado that would release a triple IPA in the spring and then they'd release the same beer in the fall and they, they would call it a barley wine. So I, I'm a subscriber to that. I mean, like, uh -huh. the beer is all about what you love in it. And if it tastes great, it is what it is. Style is stuff that we just made up, you know, the, uh, the earth is what decided what went into this glass and it'll, it'll be good, man. It, it'll be different, but it'll be good. Well said. And I'm going to go back to one other thing you said, because it is worth mentioning and reiterating that hops are an agricultural product. Mm. I think beer is often discredited as an industrial product, despite the raw ingredients that go into it. Hops can be different from point A to point B, from one farm to another. They really influence and determine the character of a beer from one year and one season to the next. So I never miss the chance to fly the flag for beer as a living, breathing agricultural product compared to wine or anything else. And you've done an excellent job of demonstrating this here. So I want to thank you all for geeking out and nerding out. Before we talk about music a little bit, I think Dan is doing an excellent job. What do you think, Eric and Jeff? I see why they gave you us to represent the beer, the brand, and the brewery. Because so far, you've had an answer for every question. Yeah, there you go. Um, but Eric and Jeff, what do you think? How's Dan doing? He's doing a great job. Love it. Yep. <laughs> yeah, Excellent. incredible. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm yeah, going to know where you live now. That's right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Um, well, I want to take a moment to talk about music. Uh, Eric and Jeff, I want you to contribute to this conversation as well, because obviously the NotFest Beer Pit is founded on the connection of craft beer to heavy metal. So... Dan, tell us about, for you personally, what is the connection between the two? What is the connection for you uh, from craft beer to heavy music, be it rock, be it punk, be it metal, be it whatever else you're into? Yeah, man. I, I touched on it earlier, but um, being honest, like we're, we're big believers in synesthesia. Like that's the, you know, the phenomenon of your senses crossing in your brain a bit, that there is no such thing as like a truly independent sensation. They're all connected a little bit. So for us, you know, we love big, bold, brash and intense beer. And we love those same music styles, too. Um, you know, I think probably I speak for a bunch of uh, people, too. I mean, we love heavy music. We love loud music. Um, you know, a bunch of us are big metalheads, to say the least. Um, and that's been a part of our DNA since the beginning. But we're also huge classic country nerds and dad rock nerds and classic rock nerds. We have classically trained pianists who play for us. We have one of the most incredible jazz drummers I've ever seen in my life who drives our forklift. I mean, like nice. that's really like the DNA that's built into our, to our brewery. We love working with musicians. Um, not as difficult as it sounds hire a musician for the love of God. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and we, we want that to be reflected in the way that our beer tastes. So, you know, a lot of times, you know, our beer inspiration starts from a name or a concept. We brew a whole series of beer we called our, our genre series, which is really definitively about that notion of synesthesia. Um, Jeff's actually wearing the T-shirt for one of them right now. That's our, uh, our, our new wave of British heavy metal inspired beer, um, just called Metal. Hell yeah. So originally when I reached out to Ash, who led me to Willie in sales, it was to see if metal was still available or how <laughs> regularly it was brewed. I mean, that's an obvious beer. I think it comes about once a year. So it goes without saying when that does come around, if it's next year, I want it in the beer pit, man. Um, but I love it that you fly the flag for metal. I love it that it's it's all it's it's all music. 
uh, the synesthesia. What was that word? I think that's the deadhead trick that you were talking about. Yeah. (laughs) Fun to say. It's fun to experience. But I love it that you're saying that beer and music, these are the same kind of, they come from the same artistic instinct and impulse. And they're two different ways of expressing the same thing. And I think that's why there's so much crossover between beer and music, between musicians working at breweries, because they provide people with a similar sense of expression, of satisfaction, of home and community. And I mean, honestly, employment that they might not have otherwise. I was someone who could not work anywhere else in any even semi-traditional environment until I discovered the craft beer industry. And there I found a home because everyone's a fucking rock star in craft beer that's just trying to like pool those past experiences into like, you know, uh, future fucking ambitions, man. So I really, I really agree and resonate with what you're saying. Um, tell us a little bit more about like what is actually playing overhead in the brewery, in the tap room. Like, what are you all listening to to get you through the day? Oh yeah. So right now I'm actually at single cut North up here in uh, beautiful Saratoga County, uh, a lot more trees than uh, Queens, but not by much. Queens is gorgeous as hell. Um, and these cats are doing an all rush Thursday, which is a little bit much for me, but I still like it. I respect it. It's very nice. Um, some stuff that we've been crushing lately in Queens, Queens is all over the place musically, which I adore. Um, but me and the sales team, uh, we have very similar tastes. Um, Advedic songs from Ohm has been on a lot. We, we love nice. that record. Anything else yeah. as narrows touches, I'm going to be in on it for sure. Um, I have his hairline, um, and his gut. So we're on the same, we're on the same wavelength. I hope that means there is a sleep beer in the not too distant future, but we've made yeah. one sleep beer. No uh, shit. What, what was it? That was mod dube, um, which is from the, the last album it was the sciences. Yeah. Like a, D- a Dune reference. We actually did that with, that was a collab with our mutual friends at KCBC. Who are big Good friends big of mine too. too. So yeah, yeah, and that was right before they came to town for the last time, which was just a f- fucking great show. Uh, um, that was at Brooklyn Steel. Uh, yeah, there was one at Steel and one at Pioneer Works. Went to you were at that show too. I was at Brooklyn Steel for that. I'm glad to witness it. Yeah, yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> Matt Pike yeah. in New York City has caused at least like five percent of my aggregate hearing loss. Um, high on fire played St. Vitus a few years and I- also there, <laughs> yeah, fuck, man. Uh, I stayed for both shows, the early and the late one. Amazing. And, uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. There is nothing quite like a shirtless Matt Pike in New York city in the peak of summer or whenever else. Um, yeah. man, I am glad that you and single cut support sleep <laughs> and high on fire. Uh, what else is playing in the tap room and what else is playing like in the brew house to get your brewers yeah. through their day? So, I mean, we're all over the place right there. Our, our forklift operator in Queens um, is like a former professional dancer who has like the craziest taste in music that's all over the place. He had us listening to Bad Bunny like three years ago, which <laughs> we didn't think we'd be into it, but we're so <laughs> into it now. Bad Bunny is the best and an incredible professional wrestler, too, for anybody who's into that. Wow. Metal. Impressive dude. Most metal. Yeah. Uh, We just did a music festival, a live music festival that still exists. Wow. An all-outdoor fest in Philly last week um, that was headlined by Heavy Temple. Um, So that's been fucking dope. We've been playing that a lot, uh, which is super cool. fucking bands. This is the last time I'm going to interrupt you before you finish this question. (laughs) Uh, I saw that you were down in Philly this weekend. I I don't know if Single Cut like helped sponsor the show yeah. or was just pouring beer at it. Uh, Heavy Temple, man. I saw them open for Yob at La Poisson Rouge in New York wow. City. At that time, it was a trio of women who were just bringing the thunder. And the lineup has obviously changed since, although Nighthawk, uh, the High Priestess, remains and likewise, the thunder remains. I love that fucking band. I have not yeah. heard their new album. What is it called? Like Lupus, Amore, something yeah, like I that. Do. Yeah. Um, but in any case, I know this was their first time back on stage in a while. And I'm grateful to Single Cut for facilitating it. I'm so glad they're back in action. And I bet it was a killer show. Was it Was it at the International Bar in Philly? It was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it so, was at the International Bar. Philly is one town that might take exception to what you said about New York City being the greatest city in the world. 
but they're so close. It's all interconnected at this point, man. And they're two great towns for beer and metal. Um, what else? What else music? Uh, I guess speaking cut, of what high else priestesses, inspires you? I mean, uh, hats off for Dorothea. Like, Windhand is constantly playing. We're all huge Windhand fans, which has been dope. And uh, throwing it back, um, this is a very special event for us. And, and not to, to bring it down, but I say it in celebration. Um, our absolute most metal of family members was our, our dearly departed um, brother and former brewer, uh, Johan, who we sadly lost last year to a bout with cancer. We got uh, Johan after he retired. He was the tour manager for Monolord for, for years. Wow. Um, was just coming through Astoria, Queens, fell in love with a friend of ours, got married, came to work for us just like as a bar back, worked all his way up, worked his way all the way up. He was a brewer for us, um, a total fucking inspiration of a dude. Um, but he's a, a hardcore old school dude. So um, Judas Priest, uh, Screaming for Vengeance, That's that's been playing since we got the sad news um, in celebration of one of the nicest, coolest dudes we ever met in our life. So a constant cheers for Johan. He would be here if he was. And we'd all be having Johan. a good time with him. Yeah. Hails. Cheers. Forever with us. Hails forever. And um, aside from that, like, oh, we're big chemist fans. You know, keeping it in the brewing family. Of course. Uh, Zach from True. A drummer for chemist and that uh covers album they put out this uh, year during pandemic was or maybe right before the pandemic either way ton of fun got to slip some do covers in there and all that yeah that was, that was awesome yeah awesome excellent um i want to know what else is coming up for single cut what is in your not too distant future uh be it events now that obviously like beer and music is coming back and tap rooms are reopened uh, if you can tell us what beers are on the horizon, if you can tell us when double dry hot metal might be back on the, <laughs> on the brew schedule, we're happy to hear it. What else does the future hold for single cut? Got something actually super fucking cool. And it's very, very timely for this event. Um, so everybody at single cut pretty much are all musicians, different, you know, levels, different experiences in the past, but playing music is really, really important. I mean, it's important, not just for Brewing beer for single cut, it's its important for life. Everybody's musical. You're a drummer, whether or not you know it. Um, so we've been working on this passion project for the past eight months. Um, it's been really difficult, so we've taken our time with it. But it's going to come out next week, and there's a sneak peek this week. So if you're by our tap rooms in Astoria, Queens, or in Clifton Park, New York, you can try this first. We're looking at you, Jeff. Jeff, this is for you. <laughs> This is called I have notes. To, I'll, I'll be the guinea pig. This nice. is called Notes IPA. So this is a beer we made to teach you how to play guitar. So a double dry hopped single IPA. A, a little bit of those beautiful oils made their way into this particular beer as well. So there's four different. Oh no. There's four, ah. there's four different beers in this four pack. Covering four of like the kind of critical chords you'd want to play to start playing rock and roll music. So you got E minor, G, C, and D. You can play a lot once you know those four chords. That's so you buy metal. this beer, or maybe you can't even buy the beer. You can't find it. You just check us out online or on social media. You're going to scan this code right there. And then it's going to launch an AR lens. So an augmented reality lens which is going to let your fingers actually play guitar right on this can that you can see right there. So right on that fretboard. So when you make the correct fingering, it'll trigger the chord to play. So you can help work on your tonal memory and get to actually like feel your way around the music. You can record yourself using the can as a guitar and, and share it with other people going on this same beautiful adventure with you. And uh, if you come in next week, this week the sneak preview, so you're just going to get the beers. Come in next week, um, we'll actually have them in a special box which stacks the beers four high. So you can have a proper fretboard on the exterior box. And instead of a normal pull tab on the cans, there is a custom made and cut pick made out of like beautiful, high quality. <laughs> Yeah, it just it. keeps going. It keeps getting better and better and better. Made by a machinist in Toronto who made them specifically to fit on our cans. So crack the beer, 
pull the pick off, launch the AR filter, and teach yourself how to play guitar while you're drinking a crazy tropical IPA. <laughs> it is the apex of all of our passions at the same time. Not only will you have a beautiful IPA, but you're actually going to learn something incredibly valuable for your growth as a person, for your growth as a beer drinker, and your nascent life as a musician. Notes IPA out next week. So stoked. Eric and Jeff, uh, voice of God, Chris, and anyone watching out in Twitch lander from home, <laughs> what do we think about that? That is possibly the coolest thing I've ever heard. And like you said, it just keeps getting better. Yeah. <laughs> so wait, except Jeff, Jeff will more. you get some and send it to me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's work that out. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's like it's like Guitar Hero, but on a beer can, right? Yeah, but you're yeah, like, you're learning how to play guitar. Yeah, it's, it's like Guitar Hero, but all the other people at the party don't hate you. They want to they <laughs> join in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you know what I'm going to say, man, what means so much to me is it is encouraging people to learn how to play guitar in the first place or to continue playing guitar. I, don't, I mean, everyone has had a, had a hard year, a hard year or two for various different reasons at home. And I've been thinking to myself, like, why did not more, why did, why didn't more music come out of this? Why didn't more content come out in response to this? I mean, there's a gap and a gulf in all industries right now, but I think at the end of the day, People just need to pick up their guitars again. And I love it that your beer is encouraging us to do that. That is fucking metal. <laughs> it's not going to make you Matt Pike, but you'll be able to bang out some Bob Dylan classics in a, in a, in a few minutes. Well, this and the resin you were talking about earlier, that will make you Matt Pike. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Turn <laughs> off, everybody. You heard him. <laughs> yeah. God, that is fucking awesome. Fucking awesome. Please. Tyler, not even just a quick shout out. Thank you so much. I hope the rating was good. I'm grateful for it, man. But shout out to you, Tyler. And if you want to drink some beer and join us on the show at any point, I hope you will. Um, and shout out to Chris behind the scenes, again, the voice of God, because working tirelessly behind the virtual curtain to bring this all together. And single cut, Dan, the most well-spoken brewery representative we have had on this show to date, even though it's the first one. And Eric and Jeff, we're so glad to have just at least a face and a name to put to some of our subscribers to know that we are heading in the right direction. Um, Absolutely. Thank so, you so much for the invite. Oh, thank you. Thank awesome. you. <laughs> Hell yeah. Um, before we even begin to wrap this up, Dan, do you have anything you want to say on behalf of Single Cut to Not Best Beer Pit subscribers out there? As my wife tells me often, I think you've said enough, Dan. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, I think every word was wise and well chosen, man. So I'm really glad the brewery put you up front and center into the pit to speak to the beer, the brand, the past, the present and the future. It's fucking awesome. Everything Single Cut is doing. And again, that you were among the first wave of new New York breweries from 2012 to like fly the flag and continue bearing this torch to present day. I mean, it was a huge part of my development in craft beer in New York City. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Absolutely. Do as thy will, be most metal. Thank you for the invitation. Grateful. Um, Eric and Jeff and Chris, voice of God for that matter, I'm going to encourage you all to come back on for one more moment. Do you have any more questions for Dan? Any more questions for Single Cut? No, he's been great. I just wish I was closer. I grew up in Rhode Island, so I wish I was closer to, to go to over there and grab it. Pump. I ought to send my dad down. <laughs> Deal. Deal. What about you, Jeff, as a neighbor? Yeah, I mean, this is this is like awesome. Uh, yeah, Dan, I hope yeah, I'll say hi if I see you around there. But um, yeah, dude, actually, a quick, your neighbor. A quick question about like the house yeast. Like, can you give us like a thirty second history of that? Like, is that is that the same yeast that that you know? Uh, has been around since single cut started. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it really is. That's it actually sick. predates that. That goes back from uh, Rich Bassetta's homebrewing days. So it started as a commercial yeast a million years ago. But yeah. you know, you can brew with yeast and get really the exact same character about six or seven times, depending on how well you keep it. Um, you know, if you're in like home brewing, go less than that because you you probably just won't have the the tools or the access to the to the lab know how to keep it perfect. But Sometimes when you stretch it, 
you know, it's Darwinism. The strongest cells will always win out. They'll, they'll over replicate compared to others mm -hmm. most of the time. And that's like 90 percent of the time. The yeast doesn't get better as that happens. It gets more aggressive. It gets more fit, but doesn't necessarily get more tasty. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you look out one out of 10 times. It grows in a really interesting direction. And one in a thousand times, it grows in a perfect direction that can take you from incredible homebrew all the way up to, you know, 50,000 plus kegs a year getting churned out on those uh, on that genetic material. Sometimes you win the lottery. Sometimes you uh, buy a go-go taquito and call it a day. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, man. Hell yeah. Shout out for go-go taquitos, by the way. <laughs> Uh, on that note, Dan, have you ever col collaborated directly with Gibson? Uh, did Single Cut ever make a, a beer for Gibson or for their showroom in New York City? Is there any tie in there or? Yeah, uh, yeah. we haven't done a direct collab, but yeah, we used to pour 18 watt in the in the Manhattan showroom when they had it for a really long time. Okay. That was dope. That was worth it just for the parties. I would have given them 10 times as much beer just for the parties. Nice. I mean, <laughs> you just get a go and there's like, you know, it's. I mean, whatever. It's not like, you know, there's like a crazy rock and roll backstage show. It's it's a party for for real music nerds. It's a bunch of the most incredible session musicians who have ever lived just sitting in the Gibson showroom in a quiet room, just shredding their ass off yeah. um, and having a room full of 500 world class musicians who just whenever they feel like it might happen to pick up a twenty thousand dollar guitar and just perform for everybody. It was incredible, man. Those were beautiful times. We, we missed that show very, very much. I know there's like a new iteration of it. I, I haven't been there myself, but that that classic old school Midtown spot was was the home of many a good, uh, memorable and forgettable time. Fair, fair. And is New York City kind of rebounding and re reopening as we speak? Oh, How yeah. does the summer look ahead? Is the city coming back to life? Yeah, you know, a lot of people left, but um, we had some people to spare. <laughs> you know, we had, when you got 9 million people and they're like, oh, 200,000 people moved out, be like, oh, great. So the line of the bodega will be one person shorter. Yeah. <laughs> no, man, we're rocking. And uh, out where Jeff and I are in Queens, I mean, we've only actually only gotten busier all through the, uh, 2020. You know, Manhattan had some folks leave. Um, it's going to be a while until we bounce back from not having commuters coming in as much. Um, that's going to be a tough uh, new dance we all have to learn as New Yorkers. Mm -hmm. um, so big shout out to like all of our bartender friends in the city. It's been a really tough year. Um, nobody's quite sure when it's going to be 100% again. But for us out in the boroughs, Brooklyn, Queens, um, the other two, um, we're doing fine, man. We're, 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 we're living life. It's it's feeling good. And Manhattan's getting back to it these days, too. Now, shout yeah. out to the Bronx. Bronx is cool as hell. Okay, there. I was going to say, yeah, for those other two boroughs or however many, I hope you're making more friends than you are enemies tonight, single cut, Dan. Staten Island, I'm collecting the enemies. Come out. <laughs> <you. laughs> this is great. This is great. I am so glad to hear about all that Single Cut has to offer to come. I'm glad it's going to be a good summer in New York City, man. I am so grateful to all of you for joining us in the pit. I want to say take a moment to check out everything Knotfest is doing. The festival is going to be back online this fall. There's going to be a road show. Slipknot is hitting the road again. So make sure to join them every step of the way because live music is coming back with a vengeance. And you might also just get the opportunity to join the beer pit along the road. So there is so much more metal to come. I really hope to have Single Cut back in the beer pit at some point. Uh, Eric and Jeff, I'm going to say thank you again for being subscribers. And to you, to anyone on the feed, Chris, any more questions before we sign off and say we will see you next time in the pit? Yeah. So, Agnes. Yeah, Agnes. Uh, I think it should be very clear here. We have a retail partner in New Jersey called Roselle Park Wines and Spirits. Uh, I work with all these breweries to get all this beer and all the product to New Jersey, where it then that it then ships to like 30 states and counting. And Agnes is the the mind, the will, the hands behind all of that. Um, so shout to Agnes, shout to Ro shout out to Roselle Park. Uh, there's so many people involved in this, and it's with them and with you that we can make it all come together. So most metal thanks all around.
Oh my goodness, Audrey, I think I owe you both a shout and an apology. So <laughs> thank you for the tireless work for social, for design, for creative. Uh, she is behind like the form, what you see online. And without online, we don't even seem to exist anymore. So thank you to Audrey for designing all the social assets, the creative and the design work that continues to bring NotFest and the NotFest beer pit to life. <laughs> okay, to Chris, to Agnes, to Audrey, to Eric and Jeff, to all our subscribers, and to you, Big Dan Bronson. <laughs> you never told us the story behind the name. Why do your coworkers call you Big Dan? They never did until now, and I'm terrified it's going to stick. It was because of that email thread, right? It is yeah, going to stick, man. Yeah, you really wrecked the next five years of my life, Adam. Thank you for that. If you're ever back on this show, we've got a new lower third for you, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. But uh, to you, Big Dan Bronson, well-spoken and well-said. Thank you so much. Until next time, we will see you in the pit.